So our panel today consists of Jennifer Bianco, who is the Associate Director of the Office of Financial Aid, Desiree Mix, who's the Assistant Director of Student and Accessibility Services, Tanya Sullivan, who's the Associate Clinical Director, Nurse Practitioner, and Pamela Watkins, who's the Student Insurance Specialist. Uh, so let's get started and we're gonna kick it right off with Jen Bianco from Financial Aid. Um, and uh, Jake, if you can put up those slides, that would be great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I am going to try to keep this as informative and as quick as possible. Um, I did try to really target as many questions as I could um, within these few couple slides. So first, I just want to go over the new initiatives for um, the 22-23 academic year. Um, financial aid has eliminated home equity from a student or family's financial aid calculation. Um, and what that means is that a uh, primary residence in which the student or family lives in is not counted. So, you know, if you have any sort of um, value in your home, let's say the, the, you know, it's paid off or you have very minimal debt on it, typically we would have used that home equity towards um, some sort of net worth value, but we actually removed all of that this year. So if you have any questions about that, then you can give us our, uh, give our office a call just to verify, but the answer is indefinitely going to be yes, that we did that. Um, the tuition only scholarship. Um, so for families with typical assets and an income level um, equal to or below $125,000 will actually get the full cost of tuition covered. So we have our zero PC initiative that was uh, rolled out a couple years ago, and that covers all of the direct costs. So that's a tuition room and meals. And now with this um, tuition only scholarship for the income ranges uh, 125K and under in typical assets, um, we're able to offer a full scholarship for the tuition, which is has been amazing. And we've gotten some great feedback so far about it. Um, and then the reduced, reduced student earnings expectations um, for our highest need students. So those students with a zero parent contribution, we actually have reduced the student earnings expectation that you would have for the summer. So that's part of the self-help portion. Um, and if a student has a, uh, an outside scholarship that they'd like to use um, and they are a zero parent contribution, I recommend reaching out to our office to just get clarification on how we can make that work towards your benefit. Next slide, please. So finalizing your 22-23 financial aid. Um, at this point, we want to make sure that there are no outstanding documents required. Um, we have all outside scholarships posted to the resource screen as far as being memoed over into um, the student account statement um, and completed all loan requirements for 21-22 borrowing. Um, that also has something to do with returning students from leaves of leave of absences. Um, so if anybody's joining us that um, is returning, you definitely want to make sure that the 21-22, it's usually an exit counseling um, form that you'd have to have to create before you can re-enter. And then also, if you do plan on borrowing for 22-23, you'd want to make sure that all that is taken care of as well. Um, now, just a little tidbit of information. We don't um, automatically uh, prepackaged loans and a student's financial aid award. So what you would do is um, if you are requesting the loan and you want to you want to take out a little bit of those Stafford loans, you can log on to Banner Self Service and request those. Um, so what I also recommend is just checking Banner Self Service um, at any given moment, you know, maybe once a week, once every two weeks, just to make sure that our office has not posted anything else on your requirement screen that we would need. Um, so just keeping an eye on that and making sure that you're checking your email um, and getting all of those documents in. Next slide. Um, as far as reapplying for financial aid, it is something that has to be done annually. Um, at this point, we only require the FAFSA, and you can complete that as early as October 1st of this year. Um, the, the FAFSA will be based off of tax information from 21, 
2021 for the 23-24 academic year. So that's, you know, we're kind of thinking ahead. So this past year was based off of um, 2020 taxes. And now moving forward, we're going to go on to 2021. Um, at this point, we only require a CSS profile from our international students as they cannot complete the FAFSA. Um, as a returning international student, you will get a code from us, so you do not have to pay for the profile moving forward. Um, so for domestic students, we need the FAFSA, and then for international students, we need the CSS profile, um, and then any other tax, tax documents or wage statements from both domestic and international students. Um, so we'll notify students in October as far as, um, you know, that it's time to go complete the application and then any other documents that we would need to collect. So there's a certain portion of um, students that we would only need a, a few uh, pieces of information and then other forms, you know, the more complicated businesses and things like that, we would need that full tax return with the business returns as well. Um, so what I would suggest is somewhere around, you know, December, um, check for the banner self-service requirements and um, just complete your application and your renewal application, all the forms. And um, we say there is a uh, deadline and they're due early February, but that just means that if a student wants to have their financial aid offer made at the first um, point in which we release them, then we would need them by early February because we wouldn't be able to guarantee anything after that. Um, so we just want to make sure that, you know, we're, we're saying that we need all of the documents, but it's not necessarily a deadline. Next slide, please. We also want to make sure students and families are aware of our appeal, appeal process. Um, so if you've had a significant change within your, um, your income, and like I said, we see it all the time based on, you know, 2020 income, and then, you know, we're two years, two years behind. So if 2022 looks a little different, if there's a significant loss of income, um, death of a parent or another immediate family member, high medical expenses, um, private uh, educational expenses, which would be, you know, elementary school, high school, um, all that stuff, or just um, high family expenses and other one-time incomes, bonuses. Um, you know, there's uh, situations where we can look at overtime depending, um, but the things that we're unable to consider on appeal is siblings in graduate school or med school or law school, um, high consumer debt and personal expenses and then expenses that have not yet occurred. So, you know, if you were anticipating that the boiler is gonna go out in your home and you haven't paid for it yet, that's not something that we would actually be able to consider until it, it starts to happen. Um, so at this time, we're in peak appeal season, mid-July. Mid um, we are still trying to get them back within seven to 10 business days. And um, if there's any sort of information that a counselor may need after the fact, um, after they've reviewed the initial documents, they might reach out for um, whatever those additional documents may be. Um, and from here, I'm going to pass it off to Student Accessibility Services. Next slide. All right, before we get to the next uh, speaker, Jen, can we ask you a couple of questions that have come through? Yes, I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> no, no, no. We're, we're going to we're gonna have a good time. Uh, so we're going to try and do it. Sometimes um, I talk. So I was like, all right, we got to get here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll get to a few. And then if we have time sure. at the end, we'll do some more. Absolutely. So yeah. um, if a student has an outside scholarship, but they're not mm -hmm. receiving financial aid, do they need to notify Brown? They would need to notify the cashier's office, depending on how the um, outside scholarship is made out. If the outside scholarship is made out to just the student, then you can process that on the student's end and use it um, for, you know, a, a payment or any educational related um, expenses. If the check is made out to Brown and the student, you just want to sign the back of it and then forward it over to our cashier's office. And then obviously, if it's just made out to Brown, then you'd want to um, send that right over to the cashier's office. Great. Okay. Thank you. Um, if a student has received work study, when does that begin and how do they go about, I, I'm not sure if this is your area or not, but do you know how they would secure a campus job? 
Absolutely. So um, working on campus and work study versus campus employment, um, which may they're they're both relatively the same. It just is a matter of how the funds are paid. Um, so it could be from a campus budget through campus employment or the federal work study budget. Um, and it really doesn't necessarily matter. Um, work study is an opportunity for students to work on campus. So it's not a requirement that students find a job. It's just an opportunity that students can find a job. And if they do, they would get paid out of one of those buckets, just like a regular paycheck. Um, jobs will be posted the first day of campus, um, and they will be in Workday. So if you go to um, the uh, University Human Resource site, Student Employment, then you'll be able to um, get some information about those jobs and when they're going to be available, and um, maybe get a sneak peek a couple days before classes as well. Great. And uh, just one more before we move on regarding loan requesting. Is this something that's offered by each semester or just annually? It can be either or. If you only want to borrow um, a little bit in one semester, you can do that. You can borrow a little bit for the whole year or you can max out um, for the whole year. The only um, trick with that is that we can't offer the entire loan amount in the fall semester, but we can offer the entire amount in the spring semester. So the fall semester has to anticipate that there is going to be a spring semester that follows and we would need to split that in half. However, in the spring, it's kind of like fall already happened and we don't necessarily um, need to apply loans to that anymore. So we then could apply all, the full loan amount for the spring semester. Great. And then just one more note before we move on. If somebody has a question after this webinar, what is the yes. best way to get in touch with your office? So if you go to our website, there is a contact us page um, on right on the banner on the top of the heading all the way to the right. If you hit that contact us page, you'll be able to um, reach our counselor calendar, our email, and also um, our phone number. So you can either make an appointment or just give us a call and we'll, we'll get everything set up with the counselor and go from there. Okay, thank you, Jen. Um, thank you. All right, Desiree, you're up next. Thanks, Mikkel. Okay, so again, thank you, Mikkel. My name is Desiree Mix. Uh, I work over at the Student Accessibility Services Office. Um, our department's mission is to provide an equitable, inclusive, and accessible environment uh, for our students. Um, one of the services that we provide is uh, reasonable accommodations um, for both undergraduate and graduate students. Um, that could be academic or exam accommodations, uh, such as technology uh, and software, such as Kurzweil or um, uh, dictation software. We also provide alternative formatting and materials. Uh, we also work with students around housing accommodations and parking accommodations. Um, some additional uh, support and services we have is an ADHD group. Um, we also work with students to connect them with off-campus ADHD or executive functioning coaches. Uh, we serve as a liaison between students and faculty when needed. Uh, we also have the DEEP list, which is Disability Emergency Evacuation Planning. And this is uh, predominantly for students that are working with mobility concerns or sensory concerns. Um, it is a priority list for any of the emergency services to double check their rooms to make sure that they are getting out safely. Um, and it also is fantastic for the winter for priority snow shovel when there's mobility need. Um, next slide, please. So we are going to talk about transitioning. Um, if you already have a student who is already working with an IEP, um, I thought it'd be helpful to kind of go over the differences between um, the high school level and the college level. So at the high school level, um, the supports and services are guided by uh, the Individual with Disabilities and Education Act. Uh, and this is an education law that's in place. Um, it, provides limited definition of disability. So there is uh, one of 13 categories that your child will need to qualify for in order to receive services. It's a little bit different than college. Um, 
services and supports are guided by the ADA or Americans with Disability Act at the college level. Um, the benefit of this is that it's a much broader definition of disability. Um, the ADA defines disability as a physical or mental impairment uh, that is limited by uh, one or more major life activity. Um, at the high school level, the um, IEP program and or IDEA also provides um, guidance that the focus is really on success. At the college level, we're looking at the focus is on access to a particular curriculum or to the program. That's when accommodations are therefore to uh, fill in the, uh, the gaps or to build that bridge. Um, as you may be uh, aware, teachers and parents are arranged services at the K-12 level um, and at the college level, students are to initiate and arrange services and accommodations. Um, uh, lastly, one thing to point out for the high school level is modifications to curriculums can be provided. Uh, while at college, students need to meet the standards of the course uh, and fundamental objectives are often not modified. Next slide, please. So some helpful information um, about our office is students can request accommodations at any time of the year. We like to recommend strongly that they be proactive and to get stuff started at the beginning of the semester. So what we have been telling students and families who are contacting our office, uh, particularly for first years, is to book appointments in August because we wanna make sure that there's a smooth transition when they're going uh, into September and moving in. There's lots of things going on. There's lots of you know, activities and orientation and having accommodations set up ahead of time is uh, what we really strive for. And while SAS typically doesn't have deadlines because we do receive accommodations and accept accommodations at any time, there are instances where accommodations need to be finalized by a certain date uh, due to other department deadlines that we work with um, for a variety of things. A couple of them are housing accommodations, Westlife do have their own particular deadlines to meet, as well as course load reductions. An important thing to note um, is the health and wellness departments um, that is you know, counseling and psychological services, better known as CAPS, health services and SAS. We all have different databases that we work with for our students. So if you happen to send um, any materials to CAPS or to health services, our department at SAS will not have access to it um, and vice versa. So I, that's a common question I get a lot um, at the beginning of the semester and you know, throughout the academic year. Um, if you submit something to a different department based on our um, federal level of privacy of information, we do not have databases that speak to each other. Um, next slide, please. Um, and lastly, this is, um, how to register with our office. So a student will complete the information and release form. That's essentially the registration form. Uh, we just wanna know a little bit about what the, the needs are, if it's housing, academic, parking, et cetera. Um, and then uh, we have a verification form, which is just a template for um, health and medical providers to complete or they can also complete uh, documentation on their own. We recommend that um, parents, families, students and health providers review our documentation guidelines that are available on the website. Um, it's helpful information about what the kinds of information that we're looking for that is most helpful when we're assessing for accommodations. Um, we do uh, recommend if you already have an IEP or a 504 in place, please feel free to send that over to us. Um, and for, like I said, first year students who are coming in, to schedule and, and take appointment with us, feel free to give us a call. Um, and the next step will be to meet with one of our SAS counselors and we can explore a variety of accommodations, support and services. And that will conclude the information session so far for SAS. All right, thank you, Desiree. All right, I think we have time for a few questions for you. Um, we had one question that came in asking if accommodations need to be renewed every single year, or does the um, form they fill out as a first year student carry over through the four years? So the short answer is both. Um, if there are um, permanent conditions, uh, students do not need to submit any additional documentation unless there's been a change in need. Um, 
But otherwise, if it's a permanent or chronic condition and we have accommodations already set in place for academics, um, all they would need to do is renew their accommodation letters. That means uh, we have a SAS portal that students can log on to. And every new semester, there's new faculty members that need to get letters. So students will just go on to their portal and then send their letters to the new professors each semester. Um, for things that are temporary, um, maybe a broken leg or broken arm, things like that, um, if we need to continue services, we'll definitely let students know ahead of time if accommodations are provisional or temporary. And then we'll ask for additional documentation if it's needed. Great, thank you. Um, and one more question. If um, a student applies for academic accommodation, how long does that take? And, and more importantly, is it typically completed before their first day of classes? Great question. So it does depend on when the student makes the appointment. Um, I will say in September, we tend to book out at least two weeks in advance. Um, and that's essentially how long it would take, depending on how we get the um, documentation, when we meet the student, um, and then when, when we meet the student, accommodations are set up that day for academic accommodations. Other accommodations outside of that, it does take a couple of days, like for parking or for housing. Um, it's a little bit more intricate, but for academic, um, I recommend getting an appointment, um, same day appointments um, can sometimes happen, uh, but typically, if they have an appointment in August, they'll have stuff ready by September first day of class. Great, thank you. And if people have general questions after this webinar, what's the best way for them to uh, reach out to your department? Sure. So we definitely recommend uh, sending us an email um, at sas at brown.edu, only because we have multiple professional staff that can answer your questions. If you call, by all means, you can definitely call. Um, but there is one or two staff that are answering phones. So the quickest way is to get an email, um, send it over to us, and we'll be able to get back to you a lot quicker. All right. Well, thank you, Desiree. Right, thank you. Um, we will move on to Tanya Sullivan now from Health Services. Great. Thank you, Mikkel. And um, I will be as brief as I can. I'm going to try to touch on the high points of the student health requirement and services that we provide, but I want to make sure I leave enough time for Pamela Watkins to review our student health insurance. So thank you for joining this webinar. It's nice to see so many attendees. So um, as you are probably aware through receiving emails and um, postage mail, there is a, a student health requirement that um, includes so students submitting information through the Brown Health Services student portal. So this is a portal that um, is a username and password um, selected for your student. So ideally it is really for the student's use. The student health portal is how health services communicates with students, not only as their incoming first year students, but throughout their time at Brown. So this is a confidential, very highly secure way that we can transmit protected health information and receive protected health information. So please check in with your student and ask them if they have logged onto the student health portal. The, um, the Brown Health Services requirement was due July 1st. Do not panic if you have not had your students submit the health requirement yet. That's okay. Take a deep breath. There is time to still complete it, but please encourage your student to, uh, to log on to the portal and submit the health requirements as soon as possible, because this time of year we're reviewing, actively reviewing all of the incoming information. And if there is missing information, we wanna make sure that there's ample time to reach out to your student to um, request that they submit whatever information might be missing. So all students at Brown University, whether they're undergraduates, graduate or medical students are required to submit an immunization record which includes both Rhode Island required immunizations as well as Brown's required immunizations. The Brown specific requirement is obviously the COVID vaccine, but there are also Rhode Island state required vaccines that all students are expected to have upon arrival, prior to arrival on campus. In addition to that, similar to um, nearly every college that's a residential campus, we require students to complete a tuberculosis screening form 
And in addition to that, a health history form. Now the health history form is really helpful for us to receive and review because if students have chronic health issues, including mental health diagnoses, or if they would benefit from connecting to one of our providers, that is our you know, initial way of, of meeting, meeting our students. And then there is also an authorization for medical care and treatment. All of these forms are accessible through the student portal. They can be electronically submitted. Some information does have to be uploaded through the portal, um, specifically the immunization documentation that would be provided by your, your home primary care provider or pediatrician. And then in addition to that, some, some additional information that can be submitted is a medical insurance card or a prescription benefit card if a family is waiving out of the student health insurance. If your student is under the age of 18, we require an authorization to treat a minor form be signed. And then for students who are NCAA athletes or varsity athletes, we also require a sports physical form and sickle cell screening test. All of the details of this information are on our website, as well as can be located on the student portal. So. Um, some homework I'm going to give each and every one of you who have attend or are attending this workshop is to check in with your student and ask them if they have submitted the health requirement. And if they haven't, please encourage them to do so. You can certainly walk them through it on your, uh, you know, side by side with them. But we do encourage students to be an active participant in this process. We really try to dissuade parents and families from doing this for their student. This is really a great experience for them to learn how to navigate healthcare and systems. And you can be right alongside them, but we really encourage them to be part of the process because ultimately this is their health. So um, next slide, please. I will also share with you that I am not only a nurse practitioner and the associate clinical director here at Brown, but I am also the proud parent of an incoming first year student myself. So I will say that I have a health requirement at their university that I have encouraged my student to also complete on their own with my help. <laughs> um, so I wanna talk a little bit about the health services fee and what that really includes. And I think it's, it's helpful for me to describe the health services fee but also thread that into a description of what the services are um, that we provide here in health services or health and wellness. Um, so it, aside from insurance, which Pamela will, will review, um, there is a health services fee that is assessed each academic year or semester, depending on the individual student. And um, that ensures that all students on our campus have access to health and wellness services. And that's regardless of insurance coverage. So um, what that means, and this is very different from primary care that you may have experienced um, outside of a, a university setting, is that health insurance is not billed for visits in health services, visits in counseling and psychological services, visits in health promotion, or for Brown EMS response. So for example, when a student checks in for an appointment in health services or CAPS, or health promotion, we're not asking them for their insurance card. We have their health insurance and that does apply for certain things such as labs or pharmacy, but in terms of our meeting with a student and interfacing with them and providing you know, general, general health care, there's not a fee associated with that. So health services itself has a, a, a host of medical providers. So we have medical doctors, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, in an entire nursing department. So uh, we provide general primary care, which includes routine care, um, acute episodic care. If a student is sick, we certainly encourage them to call us, schedule an appointment, we'll see them. If students have more chronic health issues, we also follow students as if they're, um, as if we're their primary care provider. Sometimes we refer to ourselves as the primary care provider home away from home, meaning students keep their primary care provider in their home. But when they're here at school, which tends to be about 10 months out of the year, we can certainly fill the role of a primary care provider. And when, when indicated or when clinically um, you know, necessary, we reach out to primary care providers. We also reach out to specialists that students may be connected with. We can also connect students to local specialists. For example, if a student has 
a chronic health issue and they're followed by an endocrinologist in San Francisco, but they need to establish a, you know, an endocrinologist connection here in the Providence area, we can work with that student to make those connections and also help facilitate, um, you know, if they have an appointment, do they need a follow-up appointment? Do they need labs done? So we, we really work in that capacity as primary care providers. Next slide, please. So this is a description of what the health, the student health fee covers more in a, in a pictograph. Um, I gave a little description of student-centered primary health care. We really are student-centered, meaning all of our providers and nursing staff and medical assistants and the, the um, staff who answer the phones approach our work with the lens of these are college students. And it may have been the first time they've picked up the phone to schedule an appointment, and we're mindful of that. So we're going to be a, a warm, affirming voice on the other end of the phone, helping them navigate what is it they need. We have a very robust nursing staff who does a lot of phone triage. So a lot of times students will call and they'll get a lot of really sound nursing advice about how to man manage their symptoms, whether or not they need an appointment. Uh, when we see students, we are also very proactive about asking students, especially first year students, if they want us to communicate and give us permission to communicate with a parent or another adult who is close to them. And sometimes the students are very proactive themselves and will say, yes, I have my mom on FaceTime, is that okay? And we say, yes, that's okay, as long as it's okay with you. And then there are other times where a student will say, no, I'm okay, I have this, I'll, I'll let my parents know. And we say, that's absolutely fine. Ultimately, we really like the students to make that decision on their own, but we're very proactive in asking that question about whether they want us to involve a parent. A classic example would be in our uh, respiratory clinic that we have now that we have um, been working with COVID for two plus years. Um, if a student tests positive for COVID and we're talking about isolation and navigating all of that, it's very common for us to say, is there, you know, did you want to, you know, call a parent and let them know that this is happening? Um, and, you know, similarly, if there are things that are very protected and confidential and private, then we respect that, um, that students would choose not to have something shared. But ultimately we ask those questions because we want to make sure that students know that they have you know, the ability to involve parents when it comes to medical decision-making. So included in the student health fee, in addition to student-centered primary health care is also counseling and psychological services. So CAPS has um, therapists as well as psychiatrists and um, they're accessible through our CAPS department. And we also have a 24 seven Brown Emergency Medical Services. So it's professionally led and also student operated. So, um, so we have a robust EMS crew and they have played a large role in our COVID operations, but they also respond to medical emergencies when students call. Um, we also have a health promotion and education uh, department. They do a lot of group education. They do a lot of um, health promotion through peer education. And they also do, um, they play a large role in our student orientation in the beginning of the semester, or the beginning of the fall. Um, but they also will meet with students one-on-one -on -one to talk about sleep hygiene or alcohol and other drugs or um, reproductive health questions. They are, they're all located in the same building as um, health services. And it's important for, for parents and families to understand that Brown Health and Wellness really is a 24-7 operation. So um, during the academic year, our health services is open seven days a week. We're open four evenings per week, Monday through Thursday. We also have a 24-7 nurse advice line with a, a second tier um, to call the provider on call. So a number of us share the, the call rotation and um, a student can call 24 seven and speak with a trained nurse who has a very um, you know, robust list of, of protocols. And then when necessary, they'll also um, loop in the on-call provider who's a physician or myself a nurse practitioner. And um, when, when there is truly a medical emergency, then um, you know, Brown EMS will also be able to respond. So it is important to know that we're 24 seven. We're you know, seven days a week during the academic year. And we really uh, make a priority to be student-centered and understand that these are developing adults. 
um, who, you know, when they come in as first year students, they, um, they, they, they appear and act very differently than they do when they walk across the, the stage and get their diploma. And we meet them where they are and we love to walk the journey alongside them. And with that, I believe I'm gonna hand, oh, um, one more slide, please. Um, two things, and Pamela will probably touch on this a little bit, um, important services to know that are available here on site in health services. Uh, the first one is a pharmacy. So we have our own independently um, operated pharmacy right in the health and wellness building. So if your student has prescriptions that they take on a regular basis, you can easily transfer the prescriptions to the health, the health services pharmacy and they can pick them up right on campus. Um, that is for, um, you know, off-campus prescribers can prescribe to our pharmacy. It's only for students, so it's not for staff or faculty. Um, again, our pharmacists are also very student-centered. They're also very good at working with prescribers if there is a high-tiered copay um, medication that we've prescribed and the pharmacy identifies that there is an equivocal medication that's going to be a lot less expensive for the student, they'll let us know and we'll be able to make that change. They have a really nice, um, nice array of over-the-counter medications and um, necessary supplies. So if your student needed um, you know, some cough suppressant or some ibuprofen, um, they can pick it up right here at the Brown Health Services Pharmacy. We also have an on-site laboratory. The laboratory name is Lifespan Labs. That is the lab that is associated with uh, Rhode Island Hospital. If you are choosing to waive the student health insurance, it is essential that you verify what laboratory your student will be able to use. Um, ideally, Lifespan would be an in-network laboratory. We know for students who have the student health insurance that Lifespan is, is an in-network lab, so the student will not incur cost for labs ordered at Lifespan. Um, but there are, you know, other insurances that do not consider lifespan an in-network lab, and that can often be a, a challenging point when students do come in and have a health issue where lab um, testing is indicated. But if we, if we, you know, order labs, we know that the student would incur a cost. So. Um, we ask that you not wait for an urgent situation to determine what type of insurance, um, you, what type of laboratory your insurance will cover. Either that or um, you can opt to not waive the student health insurance, keep that student health insurance. And when, when you do the, the math of um, you know, out-of-pocket expenses, please consider what the cost of, of not having the student health insurance could potentially be. So. Um, with that, I'm going to make sure we have enough time for Pamela to review insurance. Anya, can I ask you a few quick questions? Sure. Um, I just don't want to miss this question because it's really important for a number of reasons, not just for health services. But could you explain um, confidentiality, confidentiality in health and wellness and what a parent or family should do if they have concerns about their student's health? Absolutely. Um, so if a, if a parent or, or family member is concerned about a student's health or well-being, they can absolutely pick up the phone and contact health services. They can speak with a nurse. They can call counseling services and speak with a therapist. We may be limited in what information we can share with a parent unless the student has given us consent to share information. But what I would assure all parents is that when a parent calls, if we have information that we're able to share, we will absolutely share it. If we need to maybe make a phone call to the student and express uh, you know, a, de a desire or ask if we can share information, we will absolutely do that. But once a student is 18 years of age, they're legally an adult and they are protected under HIPAA, which is um, you know, really preserves their confidentiality from, you know, um, they have to be an active participant in, you know, consenting to our sharing information. But we're very proactive in ensuring that we get consent when we can get consent and have these very open and honest communications with students. And, and um, you know, it's, it, we, we, never want to be perceived as a barrier to, um, you know, parents having information that, that is important. 
Um, but, you know, we certainly want students to have um, agency and choice and feel empowered and feel like they have, you know, this is their, their healthcare experience that they're navigating. Um, but that doesn't mean that parents can't call. We speak with parents, I speak with parents almost on a daily basis. And, um, you know, and sometimes it's, it's sharing information about this, is, th these are the supports that we have available that we can, you know, we can connect your student to or that, you know, students have access to. Um, but we're, we're very open to talking with parents. We just need permission to share specific health information. Right. Thank you. That was a really excellent explanation of, of that topic. Just one more quick one, because we got it a lot of times, is these forms, um, do they need to be submitted every year or just the first year? Just the first year. So incoming um, first year students or um, graduate or medical students starting their education submit the forms um, one time. And then if there are things that need to be updated, for example, um, if we're required to have an additional COVID booster, we would, you know, we would circulate out a notification to all students and ask them to upload that information. But the health history and all of the immunizations that go back from um, age two months to present, that's a that's a one time a one time thing. And um, Thank you in advance to all of the attendees for checking in with your student about their health requirement status and encouraging them to complete it um, perhaps alongside you um, as soon as they possibly can. <laughs> all right, well, thank you, Tanya. Um, if we have time for more questions, uh, we will um, we'll get to that. It looks like, you know, we might have time for a few more before we get to Pamela. Um, can you talk a little bit about COVID vaccine requirements? Um, absolutely. So okay. yes, absolutely. So um, not unlike other universities and colleges in um, the United States, we Brown University did um, decide to make the COVID vaccine a required vaccine. Um, so we expect that all students coming into campus will be up to date with their COVID vaccines. And, um, you know, the specifics would be, you know, the two dose series plus a booster or a one dose series plus a booster. If students have a, um, a, a reason that they were not able to get the vaccine or we know with some international students, the booster availability is really based on the, their country, you know, their country requirements. So we will work with students to make sure that if they're not able to get the COVID vaccine, that they get it shortly after arrival. Um, and we had last year, um, we held COVID vaccine clinics right around the time that um, students were, were arriving to make sure that we not only required it, but then also made it accessible. Um, another thing I didn't mention um, when I was talking about our services, in addition to the COVID vaccine, we also have, uh, we offer free flu shots for all students, and we will be doing that again this fall. That's covered in under the, the health fee, but we have on-site flu vaccine clinics, and um, we all know it's nearly impossible to differentiate flu and COVID, and so we really prioritize um, having a highly vaccinated campus for both flu and COVID because we know that that's one of the ways that we can keep the university the safest, so. Great. Uh, thank you, Tanya. And I know we have a lot more questions. If people have follow-up questions for, for your department, what's the best way to, uh, for them to find it? Sure. Um, the best email address, if you have a question you'd like to send to us, is nursing at health.brown.edu. Um, the reason it's health.brown.edu is because we use a HIPAA-protected email so you can feel confident sharing protected health information. And then if we respond, it's in a HIPAA secure environment as opposed to the brown.edu. So nursing at health.brown.edu. And our website has a lot of really good, good information. We actually just re, redid our web, website. So it's all bright and shiny, but a lot of the information that you, you are probably seeking should be able to be found on the website as well, but don't hesitate to reach out by email. All right, thank you. And I think we'll get to Pamela. Uh, Pamela, you've been very patient for us. So let's uh, move to you and your slide deck. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Pamela. I manage the student health insurance plan and oversee eligibility for the Delta Dental Plan. Um, we can go to the next slide. 
So the student health insurance plan is a plan that is sponsored through United Healthcare Student Resources. Um, the plan this year runs from August 15th through August 14th next year. Uh, the annual rate for the plan is $4,255. Um, and students on the plan are automatically enrolled. So everybody who comes into the university this year that's eligible, that's enrolled, is eligible to enroll in the plan. All students are automatically enrolled and do need to waive off the plan. Um, should a student decide to stay on the plan, we ask that you check that your address on the Gallagher website is accurate and all your demographic information is correct. Students can expect to receive their insurance ID cards within like seven to 10 days following the effective date of the policy. We can go to the next slide. Um, as Tanya mentioned, we do have on-site um, services for students. We have like a souped up healthcare facility on campus. Um, and so we do ask that students access health services first um, for all their healthcare needs. For any student enrolled in SHIP, we do use Lifespan Laboratories, which is on the lower level of health services. Um, and so all of our students who are enrolled in SHIP have access to the lab um, at no additional cost outside of what they pay for the annual insurance cost. Um, and then for all students that are not enrolled in SHIP, we do also ask the same thing that Tanya mentioned that you ask um, and check with your insurance company that Lifespan is a covered lab, um, just because it's you know, it's convenient, it's right on campus, and then students won't have any delay or issues with obtaining like any lab services that they need or have to worry about incurring like any expenses that they weren't aware of ahead of time. Um, so the lab that we use is Lifespan Laboratories. Um, for our students who are enrolled in SHIP, we also have a partnership with Merriam Hospital and Rhode Island Medical Imaging. So for additional like off-campus needs and services, our students who are covered on SHIP tend to use those facilities. We can go to the next slide. Um, so the student health insurance waiver opened on June 30th, and it'll close on the 29th. There will be an extended waiver period that will open up on the 30th, and it'll run through September 23rd. So for students who haven't solidified insurance options or need additional time, some people have open enrollment on private insurance plans. They'll have like an additional window to submit the waivers um, through September 23rd. Um, Gallagher Student Health is our broker. They are auditing all waivers this year to make sure that students have adequate coverage for sick and routine care um, in the state of Rhode Island or in like the bordering states. So we're, think, we're talking about Mass and Connecticut. So if you have an HMO plan out of Mass or out of Connecticut, um, you are able to waive the insurance plan out of those states. Any other HMO or Medicaid plans will not be accepted. Um, all PPO plans, are accepted so students can waive with that. And all the waivers can be submitted at the website and the link is here, but the link is also on our website. So if you visit the health services website, there is a link for all health insurance details and it does have the link to the Gallagher website there and additional details regarding waiving. We can go to the next slide. Um, so additional details regarding like resources um, are on our website, but there are a couple things that I wanna mention. Um, for students who have HMO plans who are not sure if their plans are adequate or they're not sure if they have enough coverage to waive, Gallagher will audit the waiver and let you know whether or not the coverage is compatible. If you're interested in seeking out like information about whether or not you have, you're eligible for a scholarship for the student health insurance plan, all of that information can be found on our website. Um, so you'll wanna visit the health services website. Um, on the, the website is all the information. You, there's links to find a doctor, there's links to the Gallagher website. Um, there's links to information regarding Delta. Um, and so I wanna mention as well that Delta Dental is a self-enrolled plan. So I don't really manage the plan, but I do send information over to Delta for all of our students that are incoming that are eligible. And so if you visit the health services website um, and click on like, just click through the links, you will find more information about like scholarships um, and eligibility, Delta Dental and enrollment. Um, and then the information that you see on this plan, such as how to access Gallagher, how to access customer service, um, downloading like a virtual insurance ID card, and then also information about the United Healthcare Student Resources website. We can go to the next slide. And then I can take any questions um, that students have regarding the health insurance plan or waiving or scholarships, um, if there are any questions about that. All right, Pamela. Um, does Waiving the health insurance have to happen every year or just the first year? Yes, so students need to waive every year. Okay, 
and the students have to fill out this paperwork, right? Just like Tanya was talking about, it's better for the student to take care of it, maybe with some parent assistance. Yeah, so I recommend that students manage their health care like in totality, just because when you transition out of um, college age and then you have to go into the community to seek out health care, um, it's just an easier transition. And so if they get into the habit now, of just like managing like any records that they have from health services, any claims that come in um, that they get if they have health care out in the community, it's just easier for them to get into the habit of doing that now. Um, and so, yeah, the student will want to go on to the Gallagher student website. Um, which is gallagherstudent.com forward slash brown. And they'll ask you for like minor insurance details for whatever insurance you have now. So like your insurance ID card is sufficient to waive. Um, and once you waive, you'll get confirmation that way. Um, and so just to go into further details for students who waive, who receive a denial because their insurance is inadequate. If you're a recipient of financial aid um, and you're interested in seeing if you qualify for a scholarship, then you can send me an email. Um, and that email address is studenthealthinsuranceplan at brown.edu. And you'll just want to include in the subject line ship scholarship and attach the denial that you have. And I'm happy to review it and see um, what financial aid has available to offer a scholarship for those students. Great, thank you. Um, can you talk a little bit about dental insurance and yeah. if the health insurance covers the dental insurance um, or if they waive health insurance, is dental still an option? Yeah. So there are limited benefits available for students under 19 um, under the United Healthcare Student Resources Plan. So if you come in and you're 19 and under, there's pediatric dental that will cover you for like cleanings, minor services. Um, we also do have a partnership with um, Basic Student, which is, it's not coverage, but it's a discount where students can go on there and look for providers in the area, depending on the type of service that they need and qualify for a discount. Um, but to go further than that, we also have Delta Dental, which is self-enrolled. So all students who come in are eligible. Um, students do need to enroll in the time period where they enroll in the university. So if you start in the fall, then you'd wanna enroll in the fall because you won't be eligible to enroll in the spring, um, but it's optional. So you can go on there. The website is deltadentalri.com slash brown. Um, students can go on there and see like all the options available and self-enroll if they choose and they'll pay directly on that website. Okay. Um, can you talk about ship coverage outside of Rhode Island and international? Yeah. So the ship plan is um, nationwide coverage. There is also coverage for like our students abroad. Um, so when you're within the United States, it's a PPO plan. So you can use it throughout the United States. You want to check and make sure that the provider of your choice is in network. Um, however, there is coverage for out of network services and all of those benefits are listed on the website. Um, but you can see a provider of your choosing. So in-network, out-of-network coverage. And then when you're traveling overseas or outside of the country, all claims outside of the country are considered out-of-network for the purposes of billing. So students will pay up front and then they'll submit a claim form, um, which can be found on our website. And they'll fill it out with any payments that they made, any receipts, and they'll send that into United. And United will reimburse the student directly. Great, thank you. And um, where can parents find or students find the link to the Gallagher website? So the link to the Gallagher website is on the health services website. There's a tab for health insurance um, and under the, the help, I think it says ship actually, under the ship tab, um, there's links to the Gallagher website. There's links to find a doctor. Um, there's links to United's website as well. Um, all that information is loaded on the website. And I do wanna add too, so for students who are waiving right now um, and it's after the billing period, we are uploading the waivers um, right now, Monday, Wednesdays, and Fridays. So if you happen to waive on a Monday, you can expect to see um, the waiver posted to your account on a Wednesday. The next following day that we would post waivers would be on a Wednesday. So Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays are the date that we are uploading the waivers from um, Gallagher's website into Banner for those adjustments. Right, okay. Um, and we have had a lot of questions that we haven't been able to get to. So if people do have additional questions about student health insurance, what's the best way for them to get more information? Yeah, so they can email me at studenthealthinsuranceplan at brown.edu, or you can visit the health services website and all of the information that I just went over is on the website. Excellent. All right. Um, we are at the end of our time. So uh, thank you, Pamela. And uh, thank you, Tanya and Desiree and Jen. Uh, this has been packed with information. Um, we will, I'll be sharing that question uh, list 
that we got in the Q&A box with the, the panel here, so we can reach out to you if needed. And um, again, if you have questions that are general, please uh, send them to family at brown.edu and uh, we will follow up there. So again, have a wonderful afternoon wherever you are. And uh, we look forward to seeing you tomorrow for our residential life uh, webinar, but take care. And thanks again to my panelists. All Thank the best. You.